Let's all worship together. Great are you, Lord, mighty in strength. You are faithful, you will ever be. We will praise you all of our days. It's for your glory. so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the Savior Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I Just in sin, 
Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to see, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I Just Jesus, save your friend, and I know that thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious for grace to trust in more. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust in more. Father, we thank you for uh, this time that we have to worship together. I know uh, it may feel distant or um, challenging, Lord, to to be apart from one another during this time, but Lord, we know um, you still sit on the throne and you continue to be the only uh, one that is worthy of our worship, Lord. So as we uh, press in this morning, Lord, and just uh, lay our our, our praises uh, before you, pray, Lord, that you would be glorified uh, in our hearts and in our lives, and um, Lord, your word says that I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. I pray, Lord, that that joy would just be spilling over in each of our lives, even as we uh, watch, Lord, from uh, our own homes, Lord, uh, whatever the case may be. We want to uh, just draw near to you this morning and uh, seek your face, so we pray that as we continue to worship, uh, you would be preparing our hearts for uh, what it is that you have for us in your word this morning. And uh, Lord, we're grateful for everything that you've done and continue to do. In Jesus' name.
Thank you, guys. I invite you to open your Bibles this morning again to Philippians chapter 4. And uh, we're going to continue looking at uh, what we've been looking at for the last two weeks, going three weeks now. Um, this morning, we're going to bring it all together. And it's just a, a phenomenal part of God's Word that uh, not only applies to us, uh, during this time and what's going on in our, our country and our world, but it, 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 it applies to our lives. No matter what's going on, this is where we want to live. This is, this is the sphere of, of, of where we want to be seated uh, with the Lord. Um, we began looking at uh, these verses uh, here in Philippians 4, verses 1 through 7. And in them we have Paul's principles of standing firm in the Lord with the incomprehensible peace of God. And those are the bookends. I have 
I've uh, been telling you, the, the, these, those are bookends for us. Verse 1 tells us, stand firm in the Lord. Verse 7 tells us, and the peace of God which surpasses all camp comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In between those verses, we have principles. And when they're applied to our life, they, they produce, they yield, they lead to standing in the Lord with the incomprehensible peace of God. And so far, we've looked at four of those principles. The first one, just in review quickly, in, in, in verses 2 and 3, we are to maintain a harmony and peace with other believers. We are to have that, that, that pure fellowship that God has called us to have, we have uh, that, that lifts us up, that holds us accountable, that helps us grow in the Lord. We are to... to uh, to weep with one another, we to rejoice with one another, we are to fellowship with one another, we are to be united. Second, we are to rejoice in the Lord always, as verse 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always, again, I say rejoice. To rejoice in the Lord, as, as I explained, was just, is really to, to know him in an intimate way. In a practical sense, to rejoice in the Lord is, is to that, the creator of all things, the one who is holy and perfect and, and omnipotent and omnipresent and, and sovereign and full of mercy and abounding in love and so on, right? This God loves me and sent his son to give his life up for me. This God works all things together for his good, his good and our glory. And this is the, the one that I call Father. This is the one I call Father. This is what brings me to rejoicing in the Lord. Principle number three, sustain a gentle spirit. This is a person who is yielding his or her rights and is therefore gentle, is kind, is courteous, is, is tolerant. The, the, the gentle person is not spineless, but is selfless. Fourthly, have a confident faith in the Lord, and that is Nothing will shake you to the point where you are unable to stand firm in the Lord because you know, you know you have a confident faith that God has called you to himself. You have a confident faith that he, uh, who he, that he is who he says he is in his word. You know what he has promised. You know what he is capable of, and you have faith. You believe, which means you trust him. And not in the situations and not in the circumstances, but in him, but in the Lord. That's a confident faith in the Lord. And this morning, we're going to give you a couple more here. We'll, we'll, this morning, number five is be anxious for nothing. Look at verse six. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I found a a little article, and it said the average person's anxiety is focused on 40% the things that will never happen, 30% the things about the past that can't be changed, 12% things about criticism by others, mostly untrue, 10% about health, which gets worse with that stress of worrying about the, all the other things above, 8% about real problems that will be faced. Someone has said that youth looks forward, old age looks backwards, and middle age looks worried, anxious. It can also be translated worry. It means to distract, to divide, to draw different directions, to be drawn in different directions, which is exactly, listen, it's exactly what anxiety and worry does, doesn't it? It draws us in different directions rather than in the direction of the Lord. It draws us in a direction that instead of allowing God to determine our direction. And it's not only a command, but the apostle says, worry, right, or be anxious about nothing. In the Greek, it actually reads, in nothing be anxious. The Greek places nothing at the beginning of the sentence for, for that emphasis. And nothing be anxious. Now, nothing is a, is a pretty all-consuming word. It, it leaves out everything, right? I mean, nothing is a pretty all-consuming word. Worry about nothing. 
And I, and I confess that this is a command I, I have a hard time keeping sometimes. I sometimes break. Does this mean we're to, to look at life through some rose-colored glasses that we're not to face reality? Are we to believe that sin is not real? That sickness is not real? That problems are not real? Or are, are we to ignore the things that are going on today and just say, well, they're not real, right? We, 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 are we to ignore all these things? And the answer is no. Paul says we're to worry about nothing because on one side, the Lord is near, and on the other side, we're to pray about everything. In the context, Paul just reminded the saints the Lord is near and then follows with the exhortation that believers should not be anxious or worried. There is no greater source of spiritual stability than the confidence that, first of all, the Lord is near, right? He tells us that, and he ends uh, verse 5 with those words, um, right? Be anxious for nothing, but everything, prayer, and supplication, thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The Lord is near, not only to, to hear and to cry out for help, but also to provide help and strength. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy about a man who opposed his evangelism to the Gentiles. And he says this to Timothy. This, he says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 15, Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. At my first offense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But, verse 17, But the Lord stood with me, and strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. Paul is saying, the Lord was with me, see? He says that in verse eight, in 17. And then in verse 18, he says, look what he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed, and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. And amen. You know what he's saying there? He's not saying that the Lord will keep him safe from all harm. Okay, he's not saying that. He's saying the Lord has a divine plan for my life. Paul is saying I, the, God has a divine plan for my life. And, and that ends with me being with him in heaven. Okay? And nothing is going to cut that plan short. That's what he's telling us there. He's saying, look, I, I was vigorously opposed by someone, right? But the Lord strengthened me. The Lord stood with me. The Lord strengthened me. And then he adds, he rescued me, right? And then when he says, he'll bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom, to him be the glory forever. He's saying, he's telling us, look, I was doing God's will. He has a plan for me. And if he has a plan for me, I'm not going to die before it's my time. You see? He'll bring me to the heavenly kingdom as he has appointed it. The Lord is near. Paul says that we're to worry about nothing because the Lord is near. And then he also says because we are to pray about everything. E.E. E. Woodsworth wrote this. He says, there's a little motto that hangs on the wall in my home that again and again has rebuked me. And it says this, why worry when you can pray? The essence of worry is that we do not trust God to handle the circumstance. In a sense, we take responsibility in what is rightfully to be God's job. God, as our Father has promised, as Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount, right, that, that he'll providentially care for his children. If God is faithful to keep this promise, then why should his children worry? And the secret is simply replacing worry with prayer. The psalmist said this. The psalmist knew the secret, learned the secret. In Psalm 55, 22, it says, Cast your burdens upon the Lord, and he will sustain you he will never allow the righteous to be shaken he'll never allow the righteous to worry to be shaken you see now paul here uses an all-inclusive word again but in everything by prayer and supplication right in everything everything 
Prayer is communicating with God. Supplication refers to making known uh, specific needs to God, even conveying a sense of an urgent request, an urgent need uh, to, to God. So what do you go to God about? Everything, it says. Everything, anything. And especially those things that you might tend to worry about, right? What do you go? When do you go? When do you go? Do you wait for morning prayer? Do you wait for evening prayer? And it's like, no, you, you go immediately. One of my, my favorite movies is Fiddler on the Roof. I, I love that movie. The main character, Teve, uh, he's a milkman who's trying to keep his family um, traditions in place while marrying off his three oldest daughters, right? And uh, what I love about Teve is that he spends his life talking to Yahweh. He spends his life talking to the Lord God as though he, he is right there with him, right? Through all, for, through all the hardships. And at one point when they're, when they're leaving Russia, their family is, is leaving Russia because of persecution, Yahweh says to the Lord, he says, I know, I know, we are, the, uh, we are your chosen people, but once in a while, can't you choose someone else? I remember that. I love that. I love him. And we need to be like Yeve in, in the sense that, that, that we need to believe that the Lord is near. The Lord is watching, right? And he is there with you through, through every day, through every moment of your life. Believe that the Lord is there and that you can, you can speak to him. Never keep a, a trouble, right? Never keep a trouble Spurgeon said, I, I, he said, a half an hour, right, before you tell it to God. As soon as trouble comes, quickly give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord. Because the longer you hold that, right, the longer you keep a trouble, and the longer you keep from telling it to God, the more you're robbed of his peace in your life. The more you're robbed of his peace in your life. The antidote for worry Anxiety is prayer, right? And don't say, hey, I tried it. It didn't work. It's not something you try. It's something you do and do and do. Not something you try. It's something you do. And how you do it makes all the difference in the world. When I say how, I don't mean whether you're on your knees or hands folded or clasped or head bowed or not, what I mean is your attitude. It says this, with, thanks, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Instead of praying to God with doubt or discontentment, the believer does approach God in a spirit of thanksgiving. And it is the quality of being grateful, Right? with the implication of an appropriate attitude here. True thankfulness portrays an attitude of, listen, faith. It portrays an attitude of faith. It portrays an attitude of trust and submission to the will of God. That's what it portrays. You may say, how can I be thankful, right? Look what I'm going through. Look what the world's going through. And I would say be thankful that God has promised that no trial that a believer's face will be too difficult for them to handle, as 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says. You can be thankful that he has also promised us everything that happened in a believer's life is, is for their ultimate good, Romans 8, 28. That's the bottom line, right? Remember what we've been saying. The way you handle problems, the way you handle temptations, trials, difficulty, is a reflection of your view of God. If you understand the Lord, if you understand who he is, if you understand his power, his promises, all his resources at his fingertips, at, in, in his very words, right? And you also understand that, that he's always near, then where's the cause for worry? Where's the cause for anxiety, right? What have you got to be anxious about? If you understand that God is sovereign, that God is loving, if you understand that God is in control of everything in your life, 
for his glory and your good, if you understand that nothing is beyond the, the preview of God's control, if you understand that he's orchestrating everything for his eternal purpose, and you can rest in that confident faith, then you're going to be stable in the most serious times. Then you can go to God and pray with thanksgiving, and you can say with Job, as he said in Job 42, I know you can do all things. He's talking to God, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides, that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I've declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. And then he says, hear now, and I will speak. I will ask you, and you instruct me. I've heard of you, listen to this, by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes sees you. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. This is, this is the knowledge that enters the brain, right? We hear something by the hearing of the ear, and it goes in our brain, right? And it becomes a head knowledge. But he says, but now my eye, my eye sees you. But with the eyes, we, we see clearly. And with the eyes, when we see clearly, we, we believe. If, I, if you told me that you could throw a football 70 yards, I, I might go around and tell others that so-and-so said that they can throw a football 70 yards, Right? But if someone said to me, I don't think so, I'll bet you $100 they can't. Well, I, I probably definitely wouldn't take that bet. But if you told me that you could throw a football 70 yards, and then you showed me that you could throw it 70 yards, I'd take that bet. I'd take that bet in a minute. Why? Because of my eyes I have gained confident faith. Now Job is not saying he saw the Lord right? He's saying he saw God. Job is using the phrase, but now my eyes see thee as a, as, as a metaphor for how he has had now confident faith. I see clearly, he is saying, I see clearly, right? And believe God, God, you can do anything. That's what he's saying. I've heard of you. I've had a, I had a head knowledge and now I have a heart knowledge that results in faith. I have a faith knowledge. I see clearly and believe God, you can do anything. And you're going to God with thanksgiving because then of who, whom you know God to be. And listen, I'm not, I'm not talking about, let, let's understand something here. We're not talking about the answer to life's problems. Okay? I'm not asking you to stop trying to relieve yourself from whatever worldly problems that you have. I'm not suggesting that, that everyone should stop treating patients of a virus or, you know, taking any precautions and just pray, right? I'm not, I'm not trying, I'm not asking, I'm not saying that you should stop trying to relieve yourself of, of worldly problems, right? Trying to, not stopping trying to make things better. Right? I'm also not talking about, understand this, I'm not talking about fear. Fear. Fear is an emotion. And it's often a really good thing. There was a time I was talking with a, a college girl that um, at, at church one Sunday, and she was, it was winter, in the middle of winter, and she says, I'm working up the courage to go snow camping by myself, go hike. 10 miles and camp by myself where I just dig out a tunnel and do that. And I'm working, I'm working up the courage to do that. And I said, why? And she says, well, I got to conquer that fear. And I said, fear's not always bad. It keeps you from doing stupid things sometimes. Like going hiking by yourself at 20 below. Right? Fear. Fear is an emotion. Fear is worry. Fear is anxiety. Right? Fear, fear is, uh, sorry, fear is, is an emotion, but anxiety and worry is not the same as fear. Cut that part out. No, I can't do it. Anxiety, worry is a mental stage. It's not an emotion. Anxiety is... Listen, and worry is a mental exercise. 
in our life. It steers our direction. Fear is simply an emotion. And fear, fear is much like other emotions that God has given us. I'm talking about the answer to worry and having anxiety over the things and the problems in the world and the things and the problems in your life. Why? Because worry and anxiety will not only steal your peace, right, but it will knock you off of the rock that stands firm next to the Lord. And worry and anxiety, as I say, as I, as I already said, is a mental state that steers you away from the Lord. Now, how does worry do that? It steals you away from a God-exalting and God-dependent life and replaces him, listen, replaces him with all the human wisdom, right, and all the human solutions that we can think of to take care of that thing that you're fearful of worrying about that's how it does it this is why the apostle paul will say in just a few verses down from here right in verse 11 of philippians 4 he'll say not that i speak from want for i have learned to be content in whatever circumstances i am i know how to get along with humble means and i also know how to live in prosperity in any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. To be content is the opposite of being anxious or worried. So he says, I've learned, I've learned the secret to being content. I've learned the secret of not being anxious or worried. And when Paul says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, it's another way of testifying that, guess what? God is near. God is, is with him. Otherwise, he couldn't strengthen him. God is watching. Otherwise, he wouldn't even know what he needed. And thus, you will then experience God's peace. God's peace, right? Right? That's where we've been headed. Verse 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which replaces anxiety and the life of the prayerful believer, is, an, is impossible to experience. Listen, <clears throat> if you already have not have a peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. The peace of God, listen, this is not an absence of problems. Here, here's the phrase to take with you this week. This is not an absence of problems, but a reflection of the presence of the divine sufficiency in the midst of those problems. The peace of God is not the absence of problems, but a reflection of the presence of the divine God, his sufficiency in the midst of those problems. Jesus said in John 16, 33, he says, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation. That's just a blank statement. You're not talking about anything specific. In the world, you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. The peace, this peace, surpasses all comprehension. That means, that means the world will not understand it, right? It means that those close to you will not understand it. They don't know the Lord. It means that even at some, some times in your life, you won't understand it. I've spoken to many people and, and they've gone through something terribly hard in their life and you ask them afterwards and they went through it with just such a peace about it and you just say, how did you have that peace? And often, often, it is like, I don't know. It was just the Lord. It was just the Lord. You see, we need to live on that plane, and that plane is a supernatural plane. How do we do that? First thing is this, accept where we live. And where we live is in a fallen world. Recognize that anxiety is a byproduct. Fear, worry is a byproduct 
sorry, worry is a byproduct of this fallen state. And then go, go, go to God in prayer and let him do his perfect work in it. And God will give you his peace as you trust him. Prayer means, prayer means that, that you trust in him. Look what this peace does. Look here. In verse 7, right? It will what? It will, it shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It shall guard. It means to maintain a watch. It means to provide a security to protect, right? God peace, God's peace stands guard. And where? Over our hearts and our minds. The heart and the mind meaning the whole person, right? It means the inner man. It really speaks of who you are, right? The heart being the seat of emotion, the, the mind ref referring to the seat of thoughts. In times of anxiety, when we go to God in prayer, he gives us his peace, and this peace guards our emotions, guards our thoughts. And guess what happens? Then we are no longer an emotional wreck. And we can think clearly because it's guarding our mind also. And we can think clearly as to what God would have us do in that situation. And that's what spiritual stability looks like. So we're back at the beginning. That's what standing firm in the Lord looks like. Let's put this all together, what we've been looking at the last three weeks. All of what Paul has been saying, he's been building a spiritual tower for us here. As you stand firmly in the Lord, as you exist in an environment of love, maintaining, maintaining harmony and peace with other believers, as you focus your thoughts on a living, active, holy, sovereign, powerful, just God, resulting in rejoicing always. As you have a humble heart, not possessing a, a demanding spirit. As you begin to know your God and understand your God and trust your God, so that in the middle of grave difficulties, when you're pouring out your prayers before God, you can do so with thanksgiving, right? Right? God, in response to that kind of heart, and that kind of attitude, dispenses his peace. His peace. And the peace results in a guarded heart and a guarded mind so that even in the midst of trials and tribulation, you may act and think in a way that glorifies your Savior and your God. Listen to Isaiah. Isaiah's 26, 3 says, the steadfastness of mind you will keep in perfect peace. The steadfastness of mind you will keep in perfect peace because you trust in him. No, because he trusts in you. <laughs> That's it. You trust in God and God has called you. The great reality is that our glorious sovereign God has overruled our fallenness. And it says, it says it in John 16, 33. We already, we already read it, right? Jesus says, I've overcome the world. I must accept the fact that I'm a fallen person living in a, with, a, with fallen people in a fallen world, right? And there are manifestation, manifestations of that fallenness all over the place. There will never be tranquility in this world. There will never be perfect peace in my or anyone else's life on this earth. That's a reality. Our world has, has figured that out. They know that too. I was, you know, I was thinking that uh, our, our world understands how much problems are all in the world outside of even what's going on right now with the virus and stuff. They understand that everybody has pain and suffering and, and, and we are... The world is so interested, they're enthralled with that, right? And, and there's proofs all around us. One of them is, man, if you watch one of those music contest shows, there's two ways to get on that. One, you can know how to sing. And the other one, you just need a really good life story. And you need to have it end like with something like you've conquered it. You've conquered it. 
Never, there will never be perfect peace in anyone's life on this earth, not the peace of this world. It's temporal, it comes and goes, right? That's not where we'll find it. We won't find it in the world, but I will find my peace from God as I entrust everything confidently to, listen, not simply to his care, but to him, to who he is, right? This is an amazing, amazing verses, amazing word that God left with us to give us a confident hope in the peace of God, right? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word that is not only very good timing for today, but it is so applicable for our life, no matter what the situation, no matter whether it be prosperity or famine, peace or war. God, we can stand firmly in your love, firmly in your hope, firmly in your power, in your care, in your mercy, because we are a child of God. And we can do so in peace. Thank you, Lord, for the promises. Thank you, Lord, for the hope. Thank you, Lord, for the reality of the power of your peace in the believer's life. Amen. Let's all turn our hearts once more to the Lord in worship, and we'll close uh, the service this morning.
you guys for joining us this morning and uh, tuning in over the, uh, the web. Pray that you guys have an awesome rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Um, look forward to worshiping, uh, worshiping with you guys once again next week. Um, God bless you guys. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, glorify the Lord uh, this week.